Day zero is the moment before company formation. When a founder decides to take the plunge, follow their dream, and commit to pursuing their vision of change. On day zero, you'll hear founders tell their story. From the initial idea, through reactions by critics and skeptics, setbacks and successes, we'll cover it all. Behind every company is a founder with ambition, goals, dreams, and wisdom to be shared. Let's explore them together. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Julie Yu, General Partner at Andreessen Horowitz and also an Advisory Council member here at Day Zero. And uh, we have an awesome guest today, uh, Don Trigg, who I've known for many, many years, almost 10 years, I guess, Don, or maybe more. Um, and I'll let Don tell his story, but he is also a fellow Advisory Council member here as well. And we are thrilled to have him here, not only to talk about his path uh, and sort of his um, professional career over time, but also, most notably, uh, he is uh, recently an author of a book called The New Healthcare Economy. And uh, we're going to dive into some of the topics that he covers there and some of the key takeaways. So welcome, Don. Excited for this conversation. Um, hi, Julie. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've probably known each other about a decade, yeah. uh, which makes us both probably feel older than we like. Pretty uh, much. But I was a longtime board member uh, at a company called Kairos. Sure. Uh, that Julie co-founded, and uh, that's right. And so, and we both have a close mutual friend uh, and financial sponsor, and Brian Roberts at Venrock, uh, who was an investor in my early stage computer assisted coding company, and was early in the origin story for Kairos. Yes, absolutely. And actually, let's let's key off of that. So, why don't you walk us through, Don? Um, the multiple acts of your career. You've done a little bit of everything. So tell us uh, sort of what your path has been to this point. Sure. So um, I, uh, I've been at the intersection of healthcare and IT for uh, uh, almost 20 years now. Um, but I started in the public policy space. So I started in Washington, uh, where I worked for 10 years, um, the last four and a half years of which I was working for governor and then President Bush. Um, I knew two members of the Cerner board very, very well, Nancy and DeParo, who would go on to be a very important architect around the Affordable Care Act, and also Jack Danforth, who was a longtime senator and member of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, and also a mentor of mine. So they recruited me to come to Cerner. Um, uh, my ment one of my mentors and, and our longtime CEO there, the late Neil Patterson, uh, promised to put me onto the operating side of the business as fast as I could go. Uh, and I did that, uh, culminating in uh, three years in London uh, during the national program for healthcare IT. Uh, I then left, did an early stage company uh, uh, in computer assisted coding, uh, a lot of early exposure to NLP, which has become uh, emergent and important as we've digitized the industry. And then I came back to Cerner uh, and played a variety of roles, uh, culminating in president of the company itself. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's my truncated, uh, three minute version of my story. I'm curious in retrospect, Don, since you've done two tours of duty at Cerner, what, what was the most intriguing role that you had there? Um, well, the, the chance to run a big piece of the global business was certainly super interesting. I'd say a lot of what played out in the UK ended up being highly formative for meaningful use and the strategies that were deployed here, both in terms of what to do and what not to do. Um, so that was certainly a, uh, an exciting role. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that uh, the chance to build out the strategic growth businesses uh, outside the core EMR space, uh, almost a billion dollars in top line revenue across them was certainly very exciting. And then, you know, the role as president where you're trying to simultaneously drive the core business, but also think about adjacent market and new market opportunities um, uh, you know, all three of those roles were uh, uh, big and formative uh, experiences for me professionally, for sure. Yeah, well, um, we'll come back to some of your hot takes on the on the current state of, of the healthcare industry. And I remember every time I chatted with you, I learned like 17 new things um, just based on on your purview that you had at the company. So. Um, so thank you for it's sharing so that. You know, yeah. I always tell you that the intersection of healthcare and IT is a really fun place to wake up every morning. And um, I feel really fortunate to have been part of the industry the last two decades. 
yeah, at a very, very um, cool and interesting perch. So, um, so yeah, so for, for, for this conversation, Don, um, I thought we could, we could divide this into two parts. Uh, one is to talk about your new book, um, this, this book called The New Healthcare Economy. And, uh, and then the second part will be, as I mentioned, sort of talking about the current state of the healthcare industry and, and what you're seeing um, as kind of the go forward path for, for the system. Um, so starting with the book, uh, the new healthcare economy, I, I love the way that it's, um, it's set up. There's sort of four major themes, which are framed as the four P's, um, politics, policy, provider networks, and personalization. And each one of them could be a show in and of itself. But what I loved about the book was sort of the juxtaposition of the actual editorial you know, commentary from the three co-authors, but also a number of um, sort of intermittent interviews that you had with various you know, thought leaders around the space. Was that the intended design of the, of the book from, from the get-go? Or you know, tell us a little bit about kind of the methodology for how you guys structured it. Yeah, for, uh, for sure. So... Um, Georgetown University Press is the publisher around the book, and they were a great collaborator with us around it. Um, and uh, so they played some some uh, uh, conversational role in, in design elements around it. I think um, if you think about forces of change that were playing out before COVID, uh, the critical kind of realities that were playing out over the course of the pandemic, which are captured in a number of those interviews, and then sort of playing forward to after COVID as we inch out of the pandemic and, and what the health economy will look like. I think that was a, an iterative design uh, that came out of discussions with, with Dr. Bisbee and Dr. Um, John, but also with Georgetown. And um, uh, I think there were some pieces of it that were, that were important to the authors. I think we all agree that uh, people in healthcare come interestingly for as smart and capable they are. They tend to be bad at history and the history of the space. So providing a primer for particularly new entrepreneurs and, and new students of the space about what had played out uh, because it is foundational and formative was important. Uh, Dr. Bisbee conducts a lot of discussions with industry leaders. And so he was really the driving force behind that interview section um, and those discussions with a really, I think, pretty interesting cross-section of leaders. Um, and then again, we were keen to kind of put this decision framework in place for folks to think about, you know, what was the incremental set of changes that are likely to play out over the course of the decade? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that framing of um, viewing this as, as kind of a, a history primer for entrepreneurs who are building in this space because so much is cyclical. Um, you know, truly, uh, history does repeat itself, or at least rhyme in, in many instances. And um, and maybe I'll I'll use that you know to sort of pick one of the the key topics of the book and and kind of double click on it to get your take on what you think um, the implications of that uh, concept are for for a given area of our market, which is um, provider networks. Which you know you and I are, it's it's one of our mutual favorite topics. Um, obviously, a, a lot of what Kyra is focused on, and and so much of your work at Cerner, uh, amongst other things, but. Um, maybe maybe just walk us through, you, you've done so much thinking on this, so maybe walk us through your thesis in general with regards to provider networks and, you know, their importance as a, uh, a concept in our, in our healthcare system. And, you know, what you think are some of the key lessons maybe to learn from historical, uh, you know, sort of efforts to shape and, and build provider networks and, and how that informs opportunities for innovation around provider networks today. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is an area I'm super passionate about. It was one of the big catalysts and growth drivers for computer assisted coding, too, by the way, uh, as we pushed into multi specialty EM. But um, uh, uh, look, um, this is a, a major force of change playing out. Uh, there is going to be a significant convergence of provider and, and payer uh, in the decade ahead. It will, uh, you know, lead to new alliances and JV activity. It will also uh, introduce new competitive dynamics. Um, and I think it is uh, under uh, appreciated in its disruptive potential. Um, I think a lot of times when we think about provider networks, Julie, we pretty quickly gravitate towards MA. And, and certainly, you know, what, what were the twin forces that moved government from largest regulator to also largest payer? 
boomers aging into Medicare with a preference for Medicare Advantage, and I think the underappreciated and accelerated expansion over time, uh, once it was litigated, of Medicaid. Uh, more people in Medicaid today than Medicare. So um, those are the big forces playing out. And these provider networks are really um, uh, pay, payer type agnostic. They play out in the commercial space where we see innovations around um, uh, you know, on-site and near-site clinics, technology extension strategies into high performance networks for high cost procedures. They certainly have paid out in a high profile way around Medicare Advantage. Uh, I would also contend that we will see them play out in a big way relative to Medicaid um, and that non-traditional venues of care uh, will become really important uh, to how we define the provider network and think about um, uh, engagement strategies uh, around the Medicaid population as we start to grapple with and tackle uh, the cost curve in that space. So this, this is a big, big disruptive force of change. And the final thing, which is kind of where you and I live, is um, these rip and replace strategies around technology are uh, far too onerous uh, to work uh, for enablement. Um, uh, so th that simply won't work. The standards regime is getting better. It's moving too slow, but it's getting better. And certainly as we see CDS hooks and some of the other standards uh, playing forward, the ability to connect inside that provider workflow will, will improve. And so all of that is going to be catalytic for, I think, um, a significant acceleration of activity in this space that will be really powerful mm -hmm. and important. And that's that's a bit of what we talked yeah. about in the book. Um, I'm curious, Don, also your take on, you know, so we wrote a piece recently about the unbundling of the pay vider and how, you know, the incumbents have all started to vertically integrate, as you say, uh, state. And um, and yet, you know, leaving a ton left to be desired around certain segments of the market with regards to uh, whether it's solution offering, whether it's level of service um, or just ease of technical integration. And, you know, we obviously, you know, are always dealing with the age old question of, um, you know, can the startups out innovate the incumbents quickly enough to get distribution, you know, versus is it just inevitable that, uh, you know, anything that's a wide sweeping change in our industry, especially with regards to something like a provider network, which is so fundamental to the infrastructure of our system, can only be done through the chassis of an incumbent. Um, what, what's your thought on that? Because I think, you know, we see so many startups trying to innovate around provider networks, but again, inevitably you must start with leasing, you know, sort of a legacy version of that infrastructure to get started. And it's very, very hard to navigate around kind of the ossified structures within those incumbent uh, foundations. Um, do you think there's hope that there could be breakthroughs that are driven from, from the upstarts in this area? Um, Look, when you create value, good things happen. So, I mean, by definition, the answer is yes. I think, one, um, you know, anybody who can step into this space and do something meaningful and differentiated relative to the person, um, and, and I use person with intentionality. I mean, part of what makes technology and tech-enabled strategies hard in this space, Julia, as you and I have talked about a bunch, is sometimes I'm a patient Sometimes I'm a member inside an insurance framework. Sometimes I'm a caregiver for, you know, we both have, we have kids. So sometimes I'm in a caregiver posture, either for children or for elderly parents. And sometimes the incentive structure around my benefits design is pushing me to act in a more overt and significant way as a consumer. So I have to be able to think through technology and tech enabled services strategies that can flex against those persona types, if I can do that, I'm doing something significant and differentiator. That provider network has to um, uh, be able to uh, uh, be both digital and physical in its orientation and approach. Again, I think a huge opportunity for early stage companies. Uh, but then the final thing that I, I get frustrated with at times when I talk to entrepreneurs is the sort of naivete around uh, how things get paid for in healthcare and how pivotal and determining that is for business model. And so uh, we can't have these sort of fanciful ideas that, you know, fee for service is going to go away tomorrow. We've
We have to be thinking about ways to add value inside the current system at the same time that we advocate for um, larger change around approach. And, um, and so, yeah, I think there's great hope for entrepreneurs, but they have to really think at the health economy level, the systems level about what's playing out and then be very intentional about where they land from a starting perspective and then not give up on that bigger swing vision um, you know, that some of the eye-popping valuations that we've seen in the last 36 months, months mm-hmm. require. Yeah. So that's a great piece of advice for readers, um, especially those who are builders, is to, uh, you know, be pragmatic about about the payment flows within our healthcare system. What would you say, Don, or, or one or two other key takeaways that you hope folks that are innovating in this space take away from, from your book? Well, well look, if, if you're at the health economy level, and you're thinking about, you know, to use a big word, uh, ecosystem dynamics at the health economy level, um, you better really understand the stakeholder dynamics. In- incumbents aren't looking to go anywhere, Julie. So, you know, um, how are the, in the incumbents uh, going to think about uh, your strategy and approach? That creates opportunities for partnership, um, you know, and for, for, for some of the places where you invest and play, um, uh, and that Silicon Valley prefers, it creates opportunities for disintermediation too. But you aren't going to go into an area like the employer space without having really thought through the role of the broker uh, and how they are or aren't going to play a role in um, the diffusion of your technology into um, employer-based insurance. So, I mean, I, um, you know, that's why people want to go work with, with AH and with you is that, Hey, you've been through it and um, and you, you kind of know what works and what doesn't work. Um, but the incumbents, I think, are more ripe to partnership than ever before. I think that brings its own set of complexities, too, for smaller and early stage companies who don't. Know yeah, how to partner. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Awesome. And then, you know, as you, a lot of times as we're doing, you know, as certainly as I'm writing a blog post, it's oftentimes the writing of the blog post that um, sort of inspires what the next blog post is going to be. I'm curious as you, um, you know, now now your book is out there and you've, you know, you guys covered a lot of, of comprehensive topics. Was there anything that you sort of discovered or learned or came across during the writing of that, that inspires what your next book might be about? Look, I would, um, I would, I would do another book uh, for sure. Um, we sort of tiptoe into um, uh, lessons for leaders, which is the subtitle for the book. But um, I'd love to a little bit like you and I do when we're when we're getting together, talk about um, some of the really tangible examples and the translational learning for leaders that come out of that um, uh, in a more tangible way. So I think, you know, if I could go back and either add to the book or or um, author a sequel, it would be all about kind of as an operator, how I would pull out, you know, the right 10 examples to really surface, um, uh, you know, what it looks like to look. A lot of, a lot of my thinking on approach is an outcome of, of, of failure. Um, and, and not, in, not wanting to replicate mistakes. And so uh, surfacing that in a tangible way for people would, I think, be uh, super fun. I don't plan to do that anytime <laughs> soon, but, um, but if, I, you know, if I, Ron Adner from, from Dartmouth did the foreword, he's a friend, you know, we talk about, you know, that'd be the kind of thing if I were going to go up to, to teach a class, that's, that's what I would go talk to Amazing. students about. For sure. I would love to speak in your class, Don, if you ever do that. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Very cool. Um, great. Well, that um, gives folks um, a bit of a primer on the book. So everyone go, go buy the book and, and read it and, um, you know, reach out to us with your thoughts. Uh, in the last few minutes here, Don, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and um, take sort of a forward looking look at, 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 this, at the healthcare system. And um, I think in particular, as you say, you know, the last couple of years, we've seen um, a huge amount of, of explosion of innovation um, from the digital health and health tech ecosystem. And um, and yet here we sit in 2022 with the tide washing out and 
showing a lot of assets who don't appear to be wearing any swimming suits, as they say. So, you know, what's your take on where we are in, in the arc of that of that innovation wave? And what do you hope to see in the next generation of companies that, that do make it through, um, especially to the public markets and, um, and are able to demonstrate that, that long term durability and defensibility that we ho- all hope to see? Yeah, look, I mean, um, I, I, you know me, Julie. I mean, I'm as an entrepreneur and an operator, I'm super impatient. I always want to go faster. I think it is important in the context of healthcare to think about uh, and have reasonable expectations around diffusion rate of change. I mean, just it, and and so um, health healthcare in that sense does operate differently. I think you measure in decades um, uh, in a lot of ways. And I think you have to be very smart in terms of how you think through capital and capital allocation decisions contextual for that. So, you know, if if um, if I'm going to go build a business around uh, a better and more aggressive version of of macro and and, a, you know, wholesale shift to episodic bundles, um, that's going to play out incrementally. Uh, not not radically in a in a single session of Congress, and so I've got to be smart in terms of how I build out those proof points, how I partner, um, and how I look to create uh, scale examples of my capability set as a as an early stage company. So um, all that's a sort of a labor way of saying I just think, hey, maybe maybe people weren't realistic in terms of what they thought this was going to look like or how quickly it was going to play out. Um, this is going to be a huge decade in, in healthcare. I, I fundamentally believe that it will see as much change play out as any time since the inception of Medicare and Medicaid back in the 60s. I mean, we have digitized the content of the industry and it's going to have big second and third order impacts. Um, but I think we have to be smart and realistic about what that looks like. Um, uh, because I think we will measure it in mm-hmm. years, not quarters. Hundred percent. I think it's always good to remind ourselves, you know, how recently the iPhone came out, and how recently even the internet became a mainstream thing. And you know, we're we're talking, um, you know, a, a couple of decades at, at, at that you know that uh, led to kind of the mass adoption of many of the things that we now consider everyday solutions. But for sure. um, we're only just at the beginning of for that sure. for our space, for sure. Um, for sure. And like, I, I think one of the things that's super interesting is not just, you know, if you think about kind of forces of disruptive change, I think that Amazon is a super interesting use case as a force of disruptive change. I think Walmart's fight back around uh, that competitive dynamic and what they've done around physical digital is almost as interesting, um, uh, including some of the choices they made against business model. Uh, and things like groceries, uh, curbside delivery, home delivery, um, you know, that I think represent the sort of uh, move to multi-channel that play out in a way that sometimes is underappreciated. And which, if you think about it from a payment model perspective, will be super relevant. to Yeah. To and to that point, you know, often, as much shade as there is cast on startups, um, you know, there's been equal amounts of shade cast on like the big, you know, sort of retailers and, and consumer players and tech players that have all tried their hand in various ways and shapes and forms in healthcare over the last decade or so. Um who do you think, I, I think right now is a unique opportunity for, you know, folks who might have been underappreciated to emerge given, you know, both the struggles of the incumbents, but also the fact that um, there will be some, you know, drawback on, on the startup side as well. Um, who would you say is, is kind of a, a key underdog player that you think will emerge in the in the next, let's call it decade, as a primary winner that you think folks are are undervaluing today? Well, look, there's there's been a lot of focus on big tech uh, and big tech entry into the space, um, either because of, you know, swings like Haven uh, or, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft buying nuance. Um, So there's been a lot of focus on big tech, um, uh, you know, and and maybe some cheering when some of those things have underperformed and and, and not played out. from the from the gallery, there's also been some focus, I think, to this discussion on what I call out in players. 
someone like Walmart who's thinking about the vertical, thinking about how they can take their store footprint and fundamentally design it into the provider network on an MSA by MSA basis. Uh, and I think both of those things are super interesting. I think one of the stakeholders uh, that get, gets underappreciated are the large um, healthcare big caps. And, um, and so, you know, that may seem a little self-evident given, um, you know, what a powerful force Optum has become uh, on a multi-quarter, multi-year basis. But I think the thing that they show up with in addition to capital, which big tech and the odd end players have too, is they show up with healthcare competency. And, um, and I think that's pretty pivotal because it's very hard for me coming from outside of healthcare with a very good core business potentially to understand the complexities of healthcare, work through all the internal stakeholder dynamics, including my board, and take a big disruptive swing in the space. And so, you know, I don't know that it's an underdog story, but I think uh, on a 10 year basis, I think those big cap healthcare players, um, you know, like the United Optums um, and, and even, you know, some of the other payers uh, who have, you know, thought about, I'll call them plan B strategies as the consolidation efforts ran into to some headwinds. So, you know, retail and digital health space, super interesting um, what CVS is doing. Um, you know, uh, what the Walgreens and the Rite Aids are doing is they think about that network footprint and how to make it relevant. Mm -hmm. So th yeah. I think that's been an underappreciated dynamic. Yeah. Well, Optum does not have the privilege of ever get, get being able to be called an, an underdog. So uh, they are they are definitely an, an important player, though, to your point, right. um, for many right. reasons. Yeah. Yeah, and speaking of incumbents, um, I would be remiss yeah. to not not ask about your, um, uh, you know, obviously within uh, the realm of what you're able to share, your your take on Cerner, and you know, Cerner is oftentimes you know said in the same breath as as Epic, right, um, as the two sort of market leaders in the EHR space, but you know, oftentimes it's sort of um, Epic as the dominant player in the market, um, despite you know their uh, certain behaviors and whatnot. But but what is what is one thing you know, given that you've been there for so long, or that you had been there so long, what is one thing that you wish people knew about Cerner or understood about Cerner that you think the majority of folks get wrong? Uh, oh, man, that's a great question. Um, so, um, you know, look, um, when you have a ton of success, Julie, and and, you know, you grow to a five billion dollar company with a 20 plus billion dollar market cap, it does work to redefine uh, what people think about uh, in terms of the business. I mean, that's a little bit of your point on Optum. They're they're a, they're a long way from being, a, 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 you know, an upstart and an, and an underdog. Um but I think the, the thing that, you know, that I love about Cerner and loved about Cerner was coming in uh, in the early 2000s when the market was really taking form. And people tend to think about Cerner uh, relative to meaningful use and the EMR, uh, you know, requirements that were put in place by CMS. Um, but the greatest part of that story is really the category creating dimensions of it around the EMR. So... You had a huge culture around patient safety with uh, uh, to air as human. Uh, you had Y2K as a catalytic force for technology investment. And you had the mapping of the genome and this explosion of medical discovery. And Neil really understood those three non-regulatory forces of change that were playing out. And at a time when everybody was buying best of breed and point solutions, uh, he really imagined the concept of a common data model. Uh, and a unified information architecture where the physician, the pharmacist, and the nurse all had ubiquitous access to the same information, uh, and it fundamentally changed clinical, operational, and financial performance of the provider. And so that's the, that's the great story. Um, you know, he wasn't using uh, our health economy framework, but he absolutely thought at the health economy level. And, mm -hmm. and what would it look like for him to uh, systemically drive change? And so that, yeah. you know, there's very few people who know that story, but it's never been more relevant. Mm -hmm. Cerner was the original provider enablement platform. They, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And, um, and there was a ton they got right and there was a ton we got wrong. 
um, and uh, uh, and probably a few things that we were right on, but too early, which is mm -hmm. uh, equally complex for the entrepreneur and for capital allocation. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I will end on with a, a question uh, on a personal level, but I know you're you're thinking about um, your next act as well. Uh, what are what are some of the the themes that you're exploring as part of your next steps, and and what excites you these days? Well, look, I I am uh, I I still think there's going to be a big and active role for the provider, and I think these strategies around real time hospital uh, become super relevant for how we manage workforce capacity hospital operations and and start to really think about ML and AI um, to drive the next phase of automation uh, and uh, and cost savings impact. Um, I am I am absolutely focused on provider network in the provider network space. Um, I did a lot of specific to Medicare Advantage, but I also like the commercial space. I think it's been under focused on and underappreciated. Um, and then look, there's a, a bunch of of billion dollar businesses that are gonna be created around secondary data use uh, and what it looks like to begin to tackle the friction between provider and payer, think about more active candidate trial identification and participation uh, in the pharma space. Um, and I'm super excited about um, uh, some of the capital strategies being put to work there. But provider network and 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 how to reimagine that space, That's that, as you know, that's my passion area. I think technology uh, and tech enabled services strategies in that space um, are very ripe and relevant. And uh, and I'm ex excited to spend more time there. Um, many of my favorite themes as well. So when you find good stuff, send it my way. I will do it. I will do it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Don, for spending time with us. Uh, Julie, uh, thank you. I think everybody knows. Um, one of your biggest fans and um, uh, Kairos was important in terms of shaping provider network and provider network strategies. And I think um, this current act at AH is really exciting. You've, you've, you've invested in some really neat portfolio companies uh, and I'm super excited to see how it plays out. Yes, and I will have patients for decades to uh, see them all play out. <laughs> right, well, right. <laughs> years not quarters for sure. Exactly, all right. Thanks so much, Don. Appreciate it. Thanks, Julie.